soon as you start to investigate it, it just melts away. Probably the most famous example is the, the, the peppered moth. This is a light-colored moth which uh, lives in the northern counties of England. And between the years 1850 and 1900, when the trees were darkened by atmospheric pollution from factory chimneys, the moth changed from a light gray color to a dark gray color so that it could remain camouflaged on the tree trunks because the birds eat the moth. Well, this was described, this process, it's even been given a, a name by Darwin, it's called industrial melanism. And it was described by the director of the Natural History Museum, Sir Gavin de Beer, as being an example of evolution and even of natural, history, natural selection taking place in man's lifetime. And obviously, if that were true, it would be very powerful evidence. Well, when you look at the peppered moth, you don't need to be a scientist to be able to see that what's happened is that originally you had a lot of light-colored moths and a few dark-colored moths, that the light-colored moths have died off because the trees have turned dark, and that the dark-colored moths have flourished at their expense. Now, if Darwinists want to call that natural selection, they're entitled to do so. But nobody could possibly believe that that is a mechanism that could explain how one species could turn into another species. And that is what evolution is all about, not about moths changing color. One of the fundamental premises of Darwin's theory is that a species can, if it evolves long enough, turn into another species. Now this central idea is contradicted by every single plant and animal breeding experiment of the last 500 years. Every animal and plant breeder knows that there is a limit to the extent to which an animal or a plant can be changed. Ultimately, the line becomes sterile or it simply reverts to the original type from which you've selected. This has even been given a name. Ernst Mayer, professor of zoology at Harvard, called it genetic homeostasis. And that simply means that there is a barrier beyond which evolution cannot pass. I find it extraordinary that the world's biologists continue to believe in the infinite plasticity of individuals when they know perfectly well that experiments show that it simply can't happen. In the first edition of his book, On the Origin of Species, Charles Darwin made a very interesting observation. He said that he could see no difficulty in a race of bears taking to the water, becoming aquatic, and eventually becoming a creature, as he said, as monstrous as a whale. So there you have the idea, bears can turn into whales just given enough time and enough natural selection. Now, in later editions of his book, Darwin removed that claim. He'd obviously thought better of it and realized it couldn't be substantiated with evidence, so he thought he'd better not press it. But the interesting thing about him removing that is that the idea that a bear can turn into a whale through natural selection is the very core idea of Darwinism. It's the, it's the top and bottom of the Darwinian theory that one species can turn into another species. And in removing that example, I can't help feeling that Darwin must have had grave reservations about the rest of his theory. The whole Earth's surface is covered with sedimentary rocks, and in those rocks there are fossils. It ought to be possible to go to those rocks and to find a sequence of fossils, one species turning into another species, turning into another species. In fact, it ought to be possible for the kids at the local kindergarten to do this on an afternoon's nature study at the local quarry. But the world's greatest paleontologists, with the resources of the world's greatest universities at their disposal, have failed to do this. And they've been looking for more than 100 years. The theory of man's rise to civilization is as mysterious as his origins. Ancient monuments around the world were built with such sophistication that they can hardly be duplicated today. Yet scientists continue to belittle these remarkable achievements. I wrote Fingerprints of the Gods because I wasn't satisfied with the answers that were being given to me to a huge series of mysteries around this planet. Most mysterious of all, a series of ancient sites uh, that have never been properly explained by historians. These sites I think of literally as the fingerprints of the gods, as marks left on our planet by a lost civilization that we have not yet properly identified. And amongst those sites, two in particular are extremely interesting. One is Giza in Egypt, where the Great Pyramids and the Sphinx sand stand. And on the other side of the Atlantic, on the other side of the world, is Tiwanaku in the high Andes in Bolivia. In Tiwanaku, archaeologists have been surprised by the discovery of small metal clamps used to hold stones in place. Amazingly, these clamps were made from molten metal, 
poured into small molds carved in the ancient stone. But nearby lies evidence of an even greater feat of technology. One of the most interesting things that has been found at the site have been what appear to be large stone molds. Apparently, they were pour pouring molten metal into these molds. This would be the pour hole, and you'd pour your molten metal in and fill it up. If it is a mold, then it's quite different from anything else we've seen in the Americas, and it would imply a far greater technology than we believed that they had at that time. We're talking about gallons of molten metal at a time, which indicates a high uh, technology in the ability to utilize this molten metal in a mass amount. All that we know about the people who built these monuments is what we can deduce from the monuments themselves. And if we look at these monuments with open minds and open eyes, we find something very interesting. Firstly, that the level of technology involved in creating them was high, the lifting and maneuvering of these huge blocks of stone. And secondly, that they incorporated fantastically accurate astronomical alignments, which could only have been the result of a very accurate observational science. So this is what the monuments tell us. They tell us that the people who built them were serious and intelligent people with a scientific outlook on life. The ability of his mind to comprehend the very things that we comprehend today is there. He is us, and we are belittling him by making him less because we have decided that, oh, this was his limitation, and we're belittling him because he was just as um, fervently intelligent as we are today, and that's obvious from the technology involved. Civilization is not this linear progression. It's a roller coaster of peaks and valleys, of ages of science and enlightenment, and the sudden dark age and collapse of civilization. The question would be, how far back in time does our roller coaster of history go? To find out how old an ancient civilization might be, archaeologists look to the monuments they left behind. But how do archaeologists determine when an ancient monument was built? One of the most used tools in archaeology is dating with carbon-14. Carbon-14 is very good for dating bone or charcoal, but it doesn't work at all on dating stone. So when you go to a site and you find in association with the stone which you wish to date, some carbon such as a campfire site, and you date that carbon, you will get a date. But that date does not date the stone, it dates the campfire site. Now, was that campfire made by people who built the site, or was it made by people who later came to the site? Since we cannot rely completely upon the dating of the artifacts associated with the site, then we must look at the construction of the site itself. And the ancients constructed this site with astronomical alignments in mind. And we can use those astronomical alignments to date the site today. The first thing that one realizes when you look at the pyramids of Giza is that they're designed along astronomical principles. This is extremely obvious simply because the base of the pyramid, for example, the square base faces, each side faces one of the cardinal points, east, west, north, and south, precisely. The precision is incredible. So it's clear that we're dealing with people who had astronomy in their mind. And we realize this very, very quickly when we look at the texts. Their texts are really astronomical allegories. They speak of going to the stars, they speak of the sun, they speak of the moon, they speak everything to do with the sky. So we have to follow that with the science of astronomy. And the logic is to understand what precisely are they trying to tell us with this kind of architectural precision. And the breakthrough came, the first breakthrough came, when it was discovered that there was a shaft within the Great Pyramid pointing to the belt of Orion. So now we had 
a very clear link between the Giza necropolis and the Belt of Orion.